All right, so like a dog with a bone, I'm not going to give this up, and I should not. The Washington Post ran the story called The Strange Star that has serious scientists talking about an alien megastructure, right? Now, these scientists, two of them, Tabitha Boyajan and uh, uh, Jason Wright at Penn State, absolutely for years went through every bit of data they could collect and one by one slowly eliminated every single possibility they could think of before they uttered the word, word alien. That's right, the word alien. This star is almost 1,500 light years away. Not quite, but almost. It has been obscured uh, at, ver at times uh, between 10 and 22% give you an idea of how obscure that is. When I say obscured, you know, the light has been obscured by something on a very erratic but predictable basis. And they actually have come up with theories about what it might be, and they certainly know what it isn't. If you take Jupiter and you put it in front of this star, it would reduce the light by 1%. So what on God's green earth could reduce it by that much at any time of day? and they made multiple observations. One of the things that they came up with uh, as a theory is something called a Dyson Sphere, which is uh, an alien civilization that would be so advanced that they would put up something that would obscure to us the light of a star while harnessing the power of a star. That would make it, uh, according to Michio Kaku, a Type two civilization. Almost everybody is very, very excited about this. Dr. Kaku said, if it's true, it'll be the story, the most important story in 500 years. I still question that, that number. Seems like it would be a bigger number. I think it might, you know, if it was actually an alien civilization, if that's what it comes down to, and believe me when I tell you, these scientists don't utter the word alien easily. Not easily at all. They think about their family. They think about their careers. They think about the rest of their life before they ever say the word alien. So I take it very seriously. I've been getting regular word from inside NASA that they also are now, after looking at the data, taking it very seriously. And they are up to 50% or better in confidence that it's real. It is what they say it is. In other words, they look at the data and they come to the same conclusions. Now, I know. I'm, I get all excited about this. How could I not? How could anybody not, actually? I want to go for a moment uh, to a good friend. He's been uh, with me for years and years and years. He is the chief guy the big kahuna at uh, SETI, Seth Shostak. And uh, I have literally dragged him from his bed to be here, his, his deathbed nearly. Not quite, but he had pneumonia, and he was very, very, very sick. Nevertheless, he answered the phone and talked to me about this story, didn't you, Seth? I did indeed, Art. <laughs> That's what I call a friend. Uh, I mean, in the middle of pneumonia, and I know you were feeling awful. Uh, and I asked you something. Uh, I said, Seth, you know, this story is, is gigantic. Uh, would you say it's as big in its own way as the SETI wow signal? Now, uh, you said yes, uh, but I, I understand you have revised it now, claiming a moment of delirium due to your illness. Uh, is that true? Well, I, I could never, I could never claim that I don't have moments of delirium. Uh, I don't know that it was delirium. You know that that's kind of a judgment, Carl uh, Art. Whether it's as uh, important as the wow signal in the end, the wow signal has never been proven to be, you know, artificial. But on the other hand, I will say this: that it's certainly exciting in the same way that the wow signal was, because it looked like a very tantalizing indication that maybe we had some cosmic company. So in that sense, it's certainly exciting. All right. Then I heard that you ordered the Allen telescopes to immediately begin looking uh, in that direction, yes? 
we have been doing that. We've been doing that since, uh, well, we've been doing that for, for more than a week now. More than a week. Well, that, it was about a week ago I passed that info on from your sickbed. Right. Uh, we began observations actually on October 14th, so that's, uh, what, 12 days ago or something like that. Okay, and today I see a memo, which I put up on the website, um, that I guess amateur astronomers worldwide are being asked to also look at the same star? Well, uh, yes. I mean, I, <laughs> that that's not in, you know, that's not my area of, if you will, I, I can't tell amateur astronomers what to look at. They'll look at whatever they want to look at. But on the other hand, if you have a newly discovered intriguing phenomenon in the heavens, you know, who wouldn't want every telescope in the world that you know, can be, if you will, corralled into looking at it, to look at it, because you might learn something. So that's definitely a good idea. All right. Um, one of the things I was contemplating, and obviously you were at about the same time, was 15 light years are just short of that amount. That's how far away it is. And I started wondering, radio signals, radio signals, let's see. Uh, there is a, I believe, even in space, there is a calculation uh, for... Uh, in other words, if, if they begin at a certain wattage of power, as they go out from Earth, kind of if, if you remember the beginning of contact, where, you know, the radio and TV signals were slowly fading as they pulled back and pulled back and pulled back, that was a perfect demo, because, you know, it's a matter of energy and, and distance, and, and over distance, energy depletes, right? Well, it just simply gets, yeah, it, anything gets fainter the farther away from it you are. I mean, you take a look at the stars, right? They, they don't blind you, but if you were up close to them, as close to them as, as you are to the sun, for example, you, you certainly couldn't look at them. So it, it's exactly the same for radio. Uh, the farther away the transmitter is, the weaker the signals are. It isn't that something is deliberately weakening the signals. It's just the distance. It's just geometry that's weakening them. Yes. I get it. Okay. Um is it fair to say that as we look at the star today, uh, we are looking back in time about 1,500 years? In other words, uh, whatever was going on or is going on on that star happened as we see it now 1,500 years ago. Yes, that's certainly the case. I mean, that's one of the nifty things about astronomy in general. You're always looking at the past. Even when you look at the moon, you're looking at it not the way it is now, but the way it was a second and a half ago when the light left it. That's probably It probably hasn't changed a whole lot in the interim. Right. And 1,500 15, years, uh, the distance to this star, KIC 8462852, that's such an awkward name. Maybe we ought to just call it, you know, Tabby's Star. Some people have done that. In, how, about, uh, how about them? You could call him them. Maybe call him Rodney. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care what you call it, Bob. It, it's all okay, but indeed... Anything you see going on there is something that happened 1,500 years ago. And, uh, you know, maybe things are different there now, but that's always the case with, with astronomy. You're always looking in the past. All right. Well, if uh, the Dyson, Dyson sphere thing is right, and, of course, it's just, you know, theoretical, I understand that, but should that actually be the case, then they were manipulating the power of the star 1,500 years ago and when you look at our rate of increase technologically in the, in the last 50 years, say, and project 1,500 years out, gee, they must be uh, wizards by now. Well, you know, indeed, in 1,500 years we've gone from, uh, I don't know, bows and arrows to something a little more powerful. I, I, <laughs> I'm sure that if they're still around, if, to begin with, if there's anybody there, if this is really the indications of a society, a civilization there, then, yeah, unless they've somehow wiped themselves out or they were wiped out before we even made these observations, before that light even left there, yeah, I mean, you're looking at their history. You're not looking at their present. Right. So we would imagine them to be 1,500 years advanced from that uh, theoretical place they were in when they started harnessing a star. Yes. <laughs> I, okay. Um, now, again, uh, I, w I wonder if you've heard any of this, Seth, that uh, from inside NASA, really, I'm getting these very good leads and these links saying, Seth, they're looking, NASA's looking at all of this data, and they're beginning to come to the same conclusion, that there's nothing left to say except the, word, the A word. 
<laughs> well, uh, I, I, I haven't seen that, and of course we have pretty good, pretty good uh, contacts with NASA all the time. Yeah, but you've been time. sick, right? Well, yeah. Although I was in the office today, I can tell you that. <laughs> but, but, but uh, a couple of things to begin with. In order to see these dips in the light coming from the star, and that's what this story is all about. Yes, this, yes, sir. It's just a, it's a star. It's a little bit bigger than the sun. It's this, you know, it's the sun's, if you will, bigger, older brother. Okay. Right? It's fifty percent larger than the sun, so it's maybe four or five times brighter than the sun. Uh, anyhow, in order to see anything happening to that star such as these big dips in its brightness, wow. in its brightness, the, the, this dimming, you need a telescope that can measure the brightness of the star and, and measure it, you know, every minute or more often. That was the Kepler Space Telescope. Yeah, it's but broken. But as... Broken. I'm, I'm sorry? It's broken. It's broken. It's, well, it's broken. You know, one of its uh, stabilizing gyroscopes, if you will, failed uh, more than a year ago now, and so it's in a completely different mode now, and it's it's not really able to look at this. So when you say, hey, there's new data suggesting that this is good evidence for an alien civilization, I don't know where those data could come from because it's very – this is something you really can't do from the ground too easily, although this dip, these dips are so big, maybe you could. But I'm not aware of any new data. I, I should point out, I, I don't want to rain on the parade here, but if you look at the paper that announced these dips, and, you know, it was just published, uh, I don't know, a week or two ago. You can't rain on our parade. We already know it's aliens. I know you do. So I, just, I just want to point out to, to, to listen. Go ahead. Go ahead. That, that uh, you know, the guys who wrote this paper didn't ever in there mention the possibility that this was anything other than natural phenomena. And that's important to keep in mind because uh, some people will remember back in the 1960s, some astronomers in England found a, a pulsing radio source in the sky, which they, you know, immediately termed little green no, men. Wait, wait, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. The guy at Penn State, I shouldn't say the guy, the astronomer at Penn State, um, he's the one who said alien megastructures. Yeah, that that's in a separate paper, but the discovery paper doesn't say anything about that. The discovery paper can, has a long laundry list of Things possible explanations. Yeah. yeah, for you know what's what's going on here, and they're all you know natural. Look, I, nobody knows what it is. It isn't to say it couldn't be alien megastructures, but on the other hand. That's, you know, I, I don't know any astronomers who would say that's the favored explanation because there's a long, long history in which you come across something you don't understand right away. And the first reaction is always to say, you know, Bob, I, I don't know what that is, so it must be aliens. Oh, and, gee, Seth, I don't know. These are, you know, one of them is an astronomer and the other is one who... Uh... Jason Wright, also an astronomer, he's the one who said that those words. And Tabitha Boyajan, I believe it is, she was the one who came up with all the data. And um, they are saying that they virtually have knocked down every you know, one of that list you talked about. They've kind of scratched everything off, except maybe a comet swarm. And the odds of that are five, they say, in 10,000 or something like that. Yeah, did they give the odds for if it, be, it being an alien megastructure? No. Okay. Nobody, well, if, if I could interview them, I would ask them that. Yeah. All right. Well, look, <laughs> I, I think that we we can you know kick this around for a while. No, no, I no. I, I don't want to keep it that long. One more. Just, I want to enlarge on the the question I asked about the radio signals, and that is right. your chance of actually hearing anything because radio is so attenuated as it goes across light years and light years. Uh, what are the chances of us actually, even if they are aliens, Seth, uh, hearing anything by radio? Well, it's hard to say. I don't think they're good. As you pointed out, 1,500 light years away, typically, when we do our SETI experiments, when we're trying to eavesdrop on alien transmitters, we're, we're looking at stars that are, you know, often 100 times closer than that. Well, 100 times closer means the signals would be 10,000 times stronger. Okay, so... If, if, if they're broadcasting radio, the only way we're going to hear them, I mean, if there's anybody there, let, let, let me preface things with that, but if, if this is really the evidence of some sort of society there, the only way we would hear the signals is if, A, 
they have really powerful transmitters. And, you know, who's to say what they've got? I mean, it doesn't violate physics for them to have really powerful transmitters. That's true. But they, they'd, they'd have to have transmitters if they're broadcasting in all directions, you know. They don't know where receivers might be. If they were broadcasting in all directions, they would need transmitters on the order of 10 trillion watts, trillion watts, for that's us to you know, pick up with the Allen Telescope Array. So that that's a lot. But on the other hand, if they're building a big mega structure, a big Dyson swarm of sun, solar power collectors, right. you know, they've got the 10 trillion watts. So that's one possibility. The other possibility if, is if for some reason, and I can't think of any, for some reason they're directing their radio signals toward us. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because, nah. you know, what's special about us? But Nothing. Uh, All right. In yeah, fact, so. if they were looking back at us, they would see us uh, that long ago, 1,500 years ago, right? Exactly right. And they wouldn't be all impressed with our technology at that point. So Well, they wouldn't be able to detect our technology. <laughs> that, that's right, because it wasn't you know, here yet. Jousting contests and stuff like that. That, that. You know, that's not the kind of information that makes its way across space. Right. Next planet, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that's right. Uh, anyway, here. So here it is. Uh, if they are using the kind of power that you talked about, harnessing the sun, uh, it seems to me they're doing something that would make a lot of electromagnetic noise. Now, I could be wrong about that, but. If you detected um, a bigger noise floor, a bigger noise level, uh, as opposed to when you pull away from that star compared to everything else, that would be something, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. That's, that's exactly what you look for, too, by the way. What you do is you essentially look at a big chunk of the radio dial as much as you can, and you say, hey, look, over this range of frequencies, there's more if you will, cosmic static coming in. It, it's not a matter of saying, you know, what are they saying? Are they tapping out Morse code or anything like that? It's just you're saying somebody's got a transmitter there. So they're making more radio energy, more power in a particular spot on the radio dial. If you found that, you would say, that's not natural. That's somebody with a transmitter. Well, you remember the old spark days, right? I do. So if they were doing something producing a big electromagnetic signature, would that have, you know, that might make big noise, and it might be possible to just look at it and say, gee, that's a high noise level. Uh, why would that be? Well, you could do that. The old spark transmitters, which I think you're referring to here, yes. you know, uh, more than 100 years ago, they're the very earliest radio transmitters in the 1890s and so forth. Uh, they, they did make radio waves, and they made radio waves that made noise all over the band, just the way a, a bolt of lightning does. Mm. But as soon as you learn a little bit about you know radio engineering, you stop doing that because you're paying for all those kilowatt hours to, to make signals that are all over the dial, whereas, in fact, you want them at a specific point on the dial sure. because you get more information that way. So, you know, I, I don't think that they're using spark transmitters, but, of course, you know, they didn't send me any uh, email about what they're using, if they're using anything at all. Right. So what I'm getting at here is, even if we don't get a, a specific signal, as it were, um, and, and we may or may not, who knows, but um, an increased noise flirt might indicate an active civilization doing God knows what. Yes. And that's exactly what's motivated us. Look, uh, you know, I'm uh, happy to bet you a bad lunch, Art, that this is going to turn out to be something completely natural. But on the other hand, and I think we're all in agreement on this, it's very intriguing. And doggone it, you don't just dismiss it and say, well, yeah, intriguing, but meanwhile, I'm going back to what I was doing. We are uh, spending time on the Allen Telescope Array. We also have a, a small optical experiment down in Panama that is looking for flashing light as opposed to radio waves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in, even though it might be improbable that – they have a transmitter powerful enough for us to detect. You don't know until you look. That's what, you know, astronomy is usually about. If, if you, you know, don't use the telescopes and don't look for something, you're not going to discover anything. All right. So, I, would, I would take it a lot of people's telescope time uh, got, I don't know what the word would be, uh, put off until much later because of this. Well, I don't know that a lot. I don't know what a lot means, but it is certainly the case for us. I mean, just to give us as an example, because I know about us, uh, we normally are using the Allen Telescope Array to survey nearby star systems. That we think, okay, these are good candidates for possibly having habitable planets. 
well, obviously we put that on hold. I mean, those those guys, it's time out for that. Mm. And we have we have spent most of the past 10, 12 days uh, looking over and over again, by the way, over the wide range of frequencies that we can tune to with our antennas. And uh, at the moment, the data are being reduced. And I figured that within a week, those data will be online and everybody can take a look. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And uh, and I'll be your first call, right? <laughs> okay. Um, is it, okay. Is that like yes? Well, of course, of course. <laughs> All, right. All right, Seth. I want to thank you for being here tonight. You're a great guy. You really are. You're one of the world's great guys. So thank you for updating us and um, keep listening. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Take care, my friend. Uh, that's Seth Shostak. Really is always been an awful lot of fun, uh, a lot of fun to interview, a lot of fun to talk to, and doing very, very, very important work. So, uh, let's see. Now let's, uh, okay. So, let me do this and this. See, I'm in here all alone. I have to be very careful what I'm doing because I'm the only one doing it. Let's look at a little bit of other news. Uh, we've got a guest coming up, so stand by for that. This is the beginning of Dead Air Week. That's what I'm going to call it, Dead Air Week. It will culminate on Friday with a show that's going to scare the out of you. Okay? Really will. But every day this week, we're going to be off into the world well, the other world, right? And so tonight we've got Dr. Michael Lynch, and he studies ghosts. So you're not going to want to miss that. Coming up, just a few things I need to get in here, and then sorry for the long opening, but that's the way it goes. Um, I am now to understand that bacon, hot dogs, and cold cuts are no good for you, cause cancer. So here we go again. I remember when it was coffee. But now it's meat. They even showed pictures of burgers. Don't you take my burgers away. Vegetarians are feeling vindicated. Skinny little people out there feeling vindicated. We're right. The meat is bad. I don't know. Others say they doubt the study, but there you go. First item on the uh, NBC News tonight, meat's going to kill you. Well, I'm already 70. So I'm going to take my chances. I've always enjoyed my meat. That's not going to change. Listen, something is going on I want to make you aware of because it's dangerous. Russian submarines and spy ships are now aggressively operating near the vital undersea cables that carry almost all the global Internet communications from point A to B to C and so forth and so on. You have no idea there are. You could go around the world many times if you put those cables together. They are vital to the Internet. And Russian uh, subs, Russian ships, are now hovering over these points. Maybe it's some kind of Russian exercise. Maybe they want to tap our lines. And God, I hope they don't want to cut our lines. So know that that's going on. This warm period uh, since the decline and fall of the Soviet Union really is beginning to cool off a lot. And, of course, we're sending a carrier into the area of the Chinese self-made islands, and that's probably going to be okay, but if it goes wrong, it goes really wrong. If they shoot at us, well, that would be really bad. So that worries me. It scares me. It really, really scares me. More than the meat, it scares me. <laughs> you know, what are they? why are they doing this? They just want to annoy us or what? I don't get it. All right, so a lot to see at artbell.com tonight. I know my guest, Dr. Michael Lynch, is going to disagree with me. You may remember I had an experience with a shadow person, right? Well, 
A fellow named Tyler has sent me a photograph that I consider to be a shadow person. And I think my guest is going to try and explain to me it's not, it's watermarks or something. But to me, this looks like a shadow person. It's a hell of a photograph. I don't think it's photoshopped. I've looked at it pretty carefully. I don't see marks of that. Keith looked at it and said, wow, he didn't either. So I want to call your attention to it. I want you to actually go to artbell.com and take a look at that. In addition, there are so many things that you need to look at. The, uh, the the full story on the star we've been talking about is up there. There are um, stories about quantum computing up there. And then there is the story of the city. This is the damnedest story. In China, I remember one night somebody called up and said, Hey, Art, have you seen the photograph of the city in the clouds in China? I said, No. I don't generally imagine cities to be in the clouds, but they've got video. I guess thousands of people saw it, and yes, they've got a photograph. In fact, they've got video of a city, or what looks like a city, in the clouds. It was a short-appearing phenomena. They think they might have an explanation for it. could be a ship on the high seas reflected to the clouds, but, man, it looks like a city to me. So that's another reason for you to go to artbell.com. Follow the story. See the video if you wish, if you dare. It's going to be a very scary week this week. In fact, it's going to be kind of building and building and building. And then Michael Lynch, Ph.D., has been a parapsychologist for 27 years. Throughout his career, he has investigated ghosts, poltergeist activity, UFOs, and ancient civilizations. That's a lot to take on. Dr. Lynch uses a digital infrared video system and the latest technology to capture evidence of the paranormal. Now, over the past 14 years, he has hosted Paranormal Tuesday at 97.1 FM in St. Louis, has been on the Discovery Channel, Sci-Fi, uh, Fox, Family, uh, ABC Family, Destination America Channel, the National Geographic Channel, appearing on shows like Scariest Places on Earth, MTV Fear, and Is It Real? He has also appeared in Shadow Worlds, The Haunted Boy, Children of the Grave 2, and the Soul Catcher documentaries. Here he is. Welcome, uh, Doctor, to Midnight in the Desert. Yes, it's it's time for the gathering gloom. Watch light fade from every room. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, it's great to have you. I, have we ever talked before? We have not talked, but one time many years ago, you had a substitute, and I was on your program uh, with a replacement. And we talked at that time. You were on vacation or something. I, I forgot what it was. But anyway, you had a substitute fill in, and mm. that's when I was on your program. So I was lost in your Rolodex or your mainframe for many years until until you he, until Heather found me and and reactivated me. So I'm like the sleeper cell of the paranormal, um, you, you might say, something like that. Heather is uh, quite a sweetie, isn't she? She is wonderful. Uh, give her a raise whenever you can. You know, like the rest of your staff, I think they're incredible, uh, incredible staff. She told you to say that, right? Yes, she actually paid me. No, no, I'm just kidding. No, no. <laughs> she, she is a sweetie. She is a, a sweetie. Yes. And, um, and so, um, yeah, let's talk Halloween. I think that's the direction you want to go. Oh, it is. I, well, I mean, ghosts and Halloween seem to go together, right? So. Yeah. Sure. Okay. You've been investigating for a very long time, 27 years. That's a long time, Doctor. Yeah. Um, it was in the early 90s we got started. And um, Why? There was, um, why? Uh, good question. Um, oh, yes, I do know why. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm getting so old now, I can't remember how I got started in this field. Um, I was at a used bookstore. And there was a book by Lloyd Auerbach. It was like oh, yeah. um, 
how to investigate ghosts or something like that. I forgot exactly. And he wrote a couple of chapters on some of his older um, cases and some of the methods he used. Okay. And um, I read that book, and I um, sit back and I thought, you know, why is it that no one really, you know, like jumps the fence and looks into this a little bit more? You know, Barry Taft had done the ent- entity case, mm-hmm. uh, very popular. Um, uh, Lloyd Auerbach came out, published several books. Um, Bill Roll uh, came out, uh, did several television documentaries. Um, there's several guys in the East Coast that have come out and uh, have been studying for a long time. Um, they just didn't have the equipment at the time, I guess. And then about 93, 94, Mm -hmm. um, the Russian military, the Russia went bankrupt. (laughs) And uh, so there was a whole new plethora of uh, infrared equipment suddenly flooded certain markets. And I had a friend who could access those markets, and we started looking at that technology. And it wasn't until another three more years till we actually developed a lighting system that would go with a certain type of camera that we could actually start seeing what we saw was energy plasma, a plasma form of energy. And then as the cameras became higher and higher resolution, we're up to 700 lines, almost HD, uh, we can now see these things uh, very clearly uh, with the proper lights the proper frequency of light, um, and we can see these things now as as clear as possible. Now, we cannot see them with the human eye because uh, our equipment, even though it can go into UV, we go toward the infrared. I think think you're talking about orbs, right? Yes, well, not only orbs, no. We're talking about a lot lot of variety of things. Okay. Um, And that's where we're going to go. Now, orbs are generally 90, I'm going to say 90%, 80% of basic consciousness in its basic state because it has to meet some type of three-dimensional standard. And, um, and that term, orb or globe, um, has been around for a long time. Dave Oyster coined that phrase. We just kept it. And so the orb is a three-dimensional sphere. And the sphere is basically um, basically energy in a wave packet. It's All a right. packet of energy. All right, Doctor. Uh, so right. what you and I are going to tangle a little bit on orbs, I think. Or maybe not. Yeah, I mean, yeah, well, that, maybe you can prove to me that I, I'm wrong. Uh, let's back up. Um, okay. How do you know, or do you know, that ghosts are real? And, and, uh, and let's define it so that we know what we're talking about. When I say ghost, I mean... An entity that has once been alive as a human being and is now presenting itself in a different form. That is what I mean by ghost. Right, right. Now, um, a ghost, how do we know that it is real? Because it has an energy signature that uh, reveals itself, and that is what we're after. Um, a, a 10 watt light bulb has a, a glow signature uh, just like a, you know similar to a hundred, but we can tell by the oh, the the basic um, density of the light that uh, it is a different type of entity. So um, a lot of this deals with energy. It is energy signature. It is a plasma form. I get it. Now, I, I, I really get it. I mean, you're, you're saying that these things, whatever they are, present themselves as energy, and that does make sense. We have energy in life. Uh, our brains contain energy, and people think it continues. And you're saying, oh, yes, it does, and that's what these are. But I just wonder how you prove it. Okay, now, okay, because this is how we prove it. Not only can we see them, we can analyze them, but the idea is that what is so unique about a ghost is that it never forgets. It maintains a memory, and it normally remembers its last form. So if you get a full-bodied apparition or even a, a cloudy apparition, it will start to reform until it, what it remembered its body last. And so really? one minute you'll have a, uh, a, a, you'll have a three-dimensional um, man standing there. The next minute you have a cloud, and it just seems to swoosh 
uh, into another area, it reforms as a man. Have you personally seen this? Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. In other words, you've seen something go from an energy state, whatever that is, a cloud, um, an orb, or whatever, and form into the image of a human being. Human being. Now, again, um, there is a, uh, another side to this, which we'll get into maybe a little bit later, but not all orbs are humans, and not all uh, ghosts are are from this planet. You know, there are entities that are animals, and then there are entities that are just okay. not from this planet. I'm, I'm all, totally, you know? I'm completely willing to buy into that. Okay. Um, I think that our animals, um, that animals, I, let me rephrase it, I think animals have souls if we do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You buy that? All, yeah, all mammals, as far as we know, because of rapid eye movement and memory, all mammals, and maybe some birds, uh, we we just anticipate that they have an afterlife. There is an afterlife for them. Now, what do they remember? They remember that they were a dog, and so their memory is that, that of a dog. I investigated a house, and this was just a basic, you know, average neighbor house and they had a dog, and the dog died. But days after the dog died, they still heard the footprints or the, 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 the nails of the, the feet of the dog clamor around on their kitchen tile. Yeah. And so they knew their dog was still there. I had another friend who had a cat, and this cat was very old. Uh, outlived most of the others, you know, cats by the longevity was just, you know, extreme. That cat died, and then suddenly the owner, maybe this is a phantom memory, but actually heard the cat, who normally slept on the staircase, meow. Oh, listen, I could fill the phones with people telling you about experiences like that. Oh, yeah. I was at a house. Uh, we were investigating. We were actually doing a little documentary on the exorcist case that was here in St. Louis. And the house we were actually filming in was, was haunted. Um, we were do, kind of doing a little, little two-sided documentary. One was to investigate the haunting of this house and then also uh, extend it into another chapter, which was the exorcist that went on in St. Louis. Well, anyway, while we were videotaping, while we were filming, we hear this knock on the door. And I'm thinking it's the audio guy uh, who's outside and, you know, he was smoking a cigarette and he's going to come back in. Well, we reach over and open the door. There is no one, no one there. Mm. Uh, it is all on camera. We record it and it's all on camera. And this was not an echo. This was not a car backfiring. This was not uh, an aberration of any, of any type because six people heard it. We recorded it. We opened the door. There was absolutely nothing there. Um, you know, there's, I have case after case like this, uh, toys move, anything electrical comes on, lights flicker. Um, it just goes on and on with electrical problems in the house, with the computer, with wireless communications. Um, we actually got to the point where we took a voltmeter. Now, this is just a, a basic uh, voltmeter. I, right. I know what it is. And you put it on uh, millivolts, DC millivolts. Right. And we would put up the little antennas, and these things would go to 100, 200 millivolts. So this was electrons in the atmosphere that had been activated. Now, when we turned on our video equipment, when we got that perfected, we could see these balls of energy, these orbs, flying by our electronic equipment and it was giving us an electron output so that means this energy is buffering or it's 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 flying through the air but it has to move through electrons electrons don't pass through right. it all right so you could actually monitor on your equipment as something got closer uh you registered higher that kind of thing exactly and as it go. moved away again okay yeah um before we get any further you have sent some uh Disturbing photographs. Right. And um, I, I presume what we're talking about relates in some way to those, right? Exactly. exactly. All right. So, yes. folks, I want to have you uh, right now, if you haven't done it already, go to artbell.com 
click on my guest's picture. By the way, people have commented, uh, Doctor, that it is a kind of an eerie-looking picture of you. I, I did a I did a series of eerie-looking pictures and several things. So um, I, I I sent Heather a few different ones, and that's the one she liked. So I see. All right. Well, well I like I it too, by the way. And a lot of people thought it was over the top serious, but I think it's cool. All right. So these are really serious photographs. Again, yes. go to artbell.com, click on his picture. This will take you to a series of what is it? Four photographs? One, two, four, five. Three, yeah, four, five, five. All right, um, I want to give them a chance to get there before we get the story behind this. Right. Um, what are these photographs? I, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to give them time. Um, tell me the story that involves the photographs they're about to see. Yeah, let me back up. Um, every year, uh, the radio station that I I have my segment on, um, does a Halloween special, and they pick, you know, uh, listeners call in and say, oh, my house is haunted, or this yes. place is haunted, let go and investigate it. Right. Well, in this situation, we had a house which was totally modern, built only a few years ago, but was infested with entities. And there was uh, some people that lived in the house, and there was a little girl that lived in the house, and she kept talking about her grandmother. Okay. Well, her mother knew that her grandmother was dead. And this little girl kept talking about an elderly woman coming to the house and saying that she was her grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, well, this frightened the entire household to the point they just grabbed a bunch of stuff and left well 97.1 fm um thought this would be a good investigation you know modern house there shouldn't be anything sure, there sure well we get there and there is what we call a soul collector what, what? and this is a soul collector uh, this is a, an individual that goes around and collects lost souls and tries to keep them in a certain area. What? Yes. That's a soul catcher. Our soul catcher. We call them collectors because they have to use some form of intimidation to keep these souls together. And uh, they, they don't really ca capture them. They just holy keep mackerel. them. Uh, hold on. Yeah. A, a soul catcher. A soul collector, whatever. Collector. This is a individual mm -hmm. who's human. Who's, who's human? Uh, who works in the same field, parapsychology, right? No, 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 no. They're dead. What? We're getting them? Ex yes, yes. Excuse but, me. <laughs> yeah, they're dead. The, oh, the soul collectors are dead. They are dead. Yes. Then how did they, how? Excuse me. How did you know? that you suddenly had walked into the presence of a soul collector? Well, we caught her voice, this elderly woman's voice, on an EVP on our recording equipment. Really? Because we were doing a show, you see, for oh. radio. And the audio guy is sitting there with the best brand new equipment sure. that radio can afford. Yes. And, and we're standing in a circle in the living room. And we are debating our next point of strategy, which was probably not a good idea that we should do. And in the background, you hear an elderly woman's voice as clear as day, as if she's standing right there in the middle of us. Yes. And she says, and she says in a very elderly voice, she says, no, I don't want you to do that. Go downstairs. Yikes. Now, she says that is clear, but she's not talking to us, even though we're talking about going back downstairs and doing another, invest, you know, a full-blown investigation with video equipment, audio equipment, still photography, and things like that. So, so she is talking to another entity. She is talking to another entity while we're talking about going back down and re, re, rethinking our strategy. Was this EVP recorded? Yes, yes, it was. It's uh, on the uh, Dave Glover 97.1 website. 
he has reactivated all of our past investigations, and we have all the EVPs there. You may have to... Oh, you know, man, you, you really, really should have told me about this before airtime. Uh, I would have put... I'm sorry, it... I've... Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, that's right. Next time. Uh, Next time. We, we yeah. do EVPs on this program, and it's a whole separate category. I'd love to talk to you about sometime. I oh, think yeah. I think it is perhaps the best evidence for ghosts, frankly, if it's done right. Well, yeah, a lot of people say that. A lot of people say, you know, EVPs, you know, and it, what, so what we so what it is, Art, is that. Okay, I'm working with this radio station. They have the best equipment possible. They're recording, you know, live conversation, and we decide to go back downstairs. We do not hear this lady's voice until later. So what happens is we go we go back downstairs, and the entities follow us. Now, um, one of the radio uh, talk show hosts are just standing there. He's not doing anything. He's up against the wall. Um, we are now going back down. I'm taking still photography. These are all my photos, so I'm taking still photography as we up, go through the basement. And then suddenly, he goes, my wait, arm wait, is... Wait, wait, is, wait, wait a minute, yeah. wait a minute. We're up against a very brief break here. Oh, I'm sorry. My guest is uh, Dr. Michael Lynch, and he's been investigating the paranormal for 27 years. So he should know what he's talking about, and uh, he was just telling us about this series of photographs that I'm telling you right now. You can see at artbell.com. I wouldn't direct you up there for, I don't know, just any little old thing. I just wouldn't. You need to see these. Go to my website, click on his photograph, and then the four photographs it will lead you to. Doctor, welcome back. And uh, so... You said suddenly, and I think that's where we broke. Suddenly, um, this gentleman looks down at his arm, and he says, my arm is on fire. It is just burning. And we pull back his sleeve, and my colleague, who is a registered nurse and also a psychic, uh, looked at the wounds. And so we saw the scratches appear almost before our eyes there were 17 claw marks scratches and they were from the inside out what so underneath his dermal his his dermis his dermal layer his skin layer there's there was some type of hemorrhaging and then they pierced through the dermal layers and then they look like scratches they sure do okay now Okay, if you're a skeptic, you can say, oh, yes, he took a paper clip and he scratched himself and it was just something for the show. Oh, no. No, no. this is not the case. As soon as the the burning, since we had, actually I took him upstairs and he went into shock almost immediately. And uh, it took three weeks for most of those scratches to heal. Now, this is not the first time. One of the people in the group had been attacked. Actually, this gentleman was attacked at another investigation, almost strangled. And there were handprints on his throat uh. from the attempt of strangulation. I was also in another investigation where one of my former partners, um, we saw the entity on video. And it flew right by him. And his, he, then he goes, something's wrong with my shoulder. All right. Well, we, we, said, you know, we skipped right down. Yeah, uh, to that fourth or the fifth photograph, yeah. whatever. Yes. Um, yeah. I don't want to do that so, because if you go a little bit higher, folks, you'll see the setup. You'll see the guy standing there, yeah. and you'll see. Well, doctor, what is it that's um, in the first picture adjacent to him, please? Yeah, uh, in the first picture, um, there there's probably uh, some orbs, and they're in a digital uh, we call a digital echo, meaning the orb is moving so fast that it leaves uh, its footprint throughout the photo. And um, let me pull that up real quick. Um, Looks uh, like yeah. it's near his hand, actually, yeah. at that point. Right, exactly. Now, this is probably the same entity. You see it three times because it's a digital echo. It's just moving toward him. Gotcha. Now, he's looking down at his hand in the first photograph because this orb, I know I know, we, we agree to disagree, um, is attacking him under or through his clothes. 
and uh, you zoom in. I zoomed in on the orb to make sure that it was a solid structure, and then he pulls back his sleeve, and he has these scratches. All right, um, Doctor, you were – these photographs came – you took them. They were taken by a still yes. camera, right? Yes, a still camera. That still camera, right. okay. So yeah. could you see, when you took these photographs, um, what we are seeing now on them? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, oh, as soon as the – it's a digital camera. So as soon as you take the photograph, you see it pop up That's on true. the rearview screen. No, I meant with your naked eye. Oh, no. No, no, no you can't. Okay. No, you can't. All right. Mm-mm. All right, so this must have, it must have occurred within seconds, I would presume, right? Yeah. All right, the I'm next sure. photograph down, you see this, I must admit, it is unlike anything I've ever seen. Uh, the orbs that I've talked about in the past that I kind of don't believe in so much are these just single points of light, but what you've got here, <laughs> that's, there's a construction to this thing. I, I don't know what it is, but. Right. Correct, yeah. It's a three-dimensional object just being squished into a two-dimensional surface. But whatever um, shape it took, and whatever shape it took, it could scratch individual marks on this gentleman. Now, All right. um, In the next photograph, it's even brighter, or else you enhanced yeah. it. I, I'm not I, sure. I, I enhanced it a little bit just to show that it was right on top or next to his arm. is right in front of him, right on his arm. Okay, I don't want to ignore this. There's structure. There is structure to this thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I don't know what that structure means, but there's something there. (laughs) There is something here. This is, uh, you know, a lot of people say they see faces, they see this, and that's just a Rorschach test. We we commonly see that. But what's really here is some type of three-dimensional ball of plasma. And the plasma has the ability to attack and scratch or maul the the, the person. And so did he begin to feel this, Doctor, instantly? Not instantly. It was something like a warm, burning sensation. So, you know, the excitement of the moment, we're doing a radio show, and then all of a sudden it became very painful. Sure. Um, like, I, like I went from a, a warm uh, um, electric pad you know, to all of a sudden there's intense pain, and then we pull back his sleeve. I totally get it. Looking at that arm, my yeah. God. Yeah. So what is unique is that dust flakes, dust specks don't scratch, and they sure don't leave EVPs mm. on your recording equipment. No. So something with human voice and human intelligence uh, defending its space or just uh, not very friendly attacked this gentleman and it, with no provocation there was no forewarning and he did not provoke uh, anything that was there he was just like in the way I guess no wise remarks or cracks nothing no no and he is the nicest gentleman you ever want to meet he, he would you know go the extra mile for anyone He's just that kind of guy, and he seems to be the one getting attacked. Now, I'm doing this, I've done this crossing my fingers a long time. I've never been attacked. Maybe it's just because I haven't been in the way. Or that, um, you know, whatever it was just kind of left me alone for reasons. But whatever this plasma is, if it's consciousness, human consciousness, it has the ability to affect our world. Now, during that investigation, there was something to do with a Barbie doll. Okay, uh, it was the little girl's Barbie doll. She kept it with her all the time. Well, we set it up as like a, a trap or something. Uh, not not a trap, but we put it out to see if it would move or these entities would do anything with it. Yes. Well. While we're setting this up on a little table uh, with some of the other toys that the little girl would play with, all of a sudden we hear on the EVP a growl. And this is like a deep, big dog kind of growl. No oh, man, you, you nope. should have brought that. We didn't know where it came from. Okay, and then the next thing we know, the Barbie doll disappears. Seriously? Yeah, 
it disappears. Okay, so everybody goes, this is this is madness, because we were just in that room. There's no way this Barbie doll could d- disappear. It's the closest object to the little girl. All the other toys, we we brought them and set, up, set them up. We search the entire house, find it in a closet, like back in the back on the top shelf of this empty closet. So hmm. this thing, these things, um, can move objects, manipulate matter, can scratch or manipulate the human body. Obviously. And... and um, can put people into states of shock. Okay, now, I, I have a question for you. Uh, again, regarding these photographs, since yeah. you were taking the pictures, um, how much time between snaps was there to capture what you captured? As soon as the flash could recharge. It was just like one second, two <laughs> seconds, gotcha. one second, two seconds, as fast as the flash could recharge. The, there is a series of cameras which we use. It's a Canon class. Uh, it's called the Sport Shot or P, uh, SP30, okay. SP40, and SP50. Um, all we use those, and those have the best flash for them. After that series, the chip, the encoded chip, started to change, and they started not to. Um, produce these anomalies because the flash on the cameras changed. Oh, that's interesting. So, um, what is it in that camera or that flash that allows you to see what is not seen on later models? Yes, it is because, uniquely, they put out what we call an infrared. There was an infrared uh, halogen oh, scenario okay. in the flash. Okay. So there was a, a, a yellow cast to some of the photos. A lot of people didn't like that, so they took out the the uh, halogen and put in what we call the blue light. I get and it. So you didn't get the red eye problem. So they put in a blue light. So a lot of your stuff, like your iPhones today, have a uh, an LED, but it's on the bluer. It's on the UV side, right? Not on the halogen infrared. Right. The the bluer um, e- the bluer is a little bit more pleasing to the eye, actually. To me, to me, but uh, obviously yeah. it doesn't yeah. capture this, and so this yeah. is really important information. There's a lot of people out there uh, in this field who are saying to themselves, "Well, then I need one of those." Where do they find them? Go to eBay. You get them for about ten bucks. They're older <laughs> technology. Ten bucks. And, uh, yeah, ten bucks. I bought one off of eBay the other day for for ten bucks and some shipping cost. Oh. Uh, people are just like throwing this stuff away. Okay, and, and the model realize. again, please. Uh, it was the it's the SP30 Canon, and it's the digital camera. And I got a, well, I got a couple laying around here somewhere. But how anyway. many uh, megapixels do you know? Uh, it's five. Five. five okay, megapixels. that's good. That's so good. It, it's not necessarily HD that everybody wants. Now they want twelve to thirty-two or sixteen or whatever. No, but it's the uniqueness of the flash associated with this camera. Exactly. Exactly. Now. Now, if you do capture, capture an orb, okay, it will have what we call a digital echo because the orb is moving. It's it's moving. So it the, the digital camera can't make a blurry picture, technically. Right. Technically, it's designed not to make a blurry picture. But on a speeding object that's moving incredibly fast and burning through electrons in the right. air, right. Um, the camera, through the flash, absorbs the flash, and then what it sees is this multitude of digital echoes. So I have this friend, he, he's over in Kansas City, and he goes, you know, I have to take a picture in a haunted house. I get this dust, and it's just all over. And I go, hmm. dude, that's like five. There's not, there's not 40 ghosts there, but there's like five. And you can actually blow them up and look at their unique signature or their thumbprint and we can see it by eliminating through contrast and brightness, not through any other form, just by contrast and brightness, we can actually see which echo, which is an echo and which is the solid form because we're looking at its density, its opacity of brightness. The, the, the less bright it is, the, the more the echo it is. And you can see them in different sizes, uh, shapes, uh, structures. Contours. That's why the anatomy of these things are so unique. And once you recognize it and recognize that it's interacting with you, 
then we're not uh, in Kansas anymore. Okay, doctor. So are you suggesting what we're looking at here in, in the third picture down or so, the one enhanced, is a, is a soul? This was once yes. a human being. It is a soul mm-hmm. or the energy. What, what's left of that? that no, it, it, it maintains its identity. Remember, you can't have consciousness without memory. Right. Memory requires a form That's of fair. energy, yep. right? Yep, so, yep. so whatever this was knew how to scratch, and it knew how to attack. So the memory may not be... Um, it, let's let's say it's um, let's say the memory is of someone who's just not very pleasant, a, a bully. Let's just say a bully. Well, that bully dies. Uh, it's still a bully, you see. Well, that that was another area I was going to go. I've had countless people come on, including EVP uh, researchers, uh, who say, "Look, whatever you were in life." If you're on the other side, you're the same thing. If you were a yeah. grouch and a mean person, you're a grouchy, yeah. mean ghost. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, odors and smells go along with some of this. Um, some people are notorious uh, smokers, and when they die, people smell the pipe smoke or the cigarette smoke or cigar smoke uh, still in that same area. Um, odors go along with this as well as uh, everything else. And like I said, um, in 2000, we really, 2001, we kind of broke the barrier, and after that, we started to realize. These things are real. They're large and in charge. (laughs) Doctor, I imagine for a second a smoker who dies and then becomes uh, an orb, as we're seeing here. And uh, you know on the other side there's no cigarette, so that orb is going to be ticked off. (laughs) No, because uh, let me tell you a little secret about quantum uh, energy. Only the human consciousness can control, or a consciousness with 20,000 genes, Uh, human consciousness can control quantum uh, fabric. So if you're over there, all you have to do is imagine a cigarette and you're smoking again. And the memory of the smoke, of the memory of the smoke becomes real. I find that in a perverted way comforting. Yes. Here's another thing. Um, there's a, I was over in England, and there's a couple of researchers over in England, and, and they sit down, and they go, here, Mike, listen to this. And I go, okay. And they turn on this tape recorder, and I'm listening to footsteps, boom, you know, like boots on wooden floors, yes. because there's a couple of castles over in Europe. And they go, there was nobody there. This was just boots on wooden floors. And I go, hmm. well, that's interesting. Um, where is this castle? And we go. And there's no wooden floors. It's all uh, limestone and, and, and marble. And I go, wait a second. There's no wooden floors here. How come? And then we talked to this uh, this guy who knows the history of this castle, and they said, yes, back in the 16 or 1500s, this was a wooden floor. So the memory of this person remembered what boots his boots sounded like. Wow on a wooden floor and it is recreated right so when people talk about like the secret you know they're projecting their wants into the universe the universe as a big machine starts to generate certain things because why the human mind can control it we can demand from our reality certain things in the afterlife, it's compliant. It's exactly the same thing. When you're an entity on the other side, the universe becomes compliant to you, um, just like it becomes compliant to us. I like that. Okay. Um, let me stop you now and ask you. Many, many, many people say there is a heaven and there is a hell, and there may be in-between spots, and that a ghost is simply... An entity that has not yet moved on. Is that consistent with what you believe? Mm, not necessarily consistent. Really? It's similar. it's similar. If you have not gone on, 
It's because you cannot accept the unconditional love of God. There is a creator. There is an afterlife. Our universe and 198 other universes are in the afterlife. It's a very big place. It's 200 zillion light years across. If the Earth was a, 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 a electron, if the Earth was an electron, the size of an electron, the afterlife is 200 zillion uh, light years across. And heaven, the creator... How can you know this? The area that God dwells is 50 zillion light years across. How can you know that? <laughs> because two things. One, it's a fractal, and it's a torus. It, it, it creates a, a torus field, so it's constantly moving. It's always vibrating. That was torus, not torsion, right? Yeah, right, torus. Yes, okay, torus. It's an energy field yeah. inside. So, <laughs> so it's a replica. It's a replica of what we see in these orbs, in this anatomy. So the consciousness of the afterlife is the same, uh, like these orbs. The anatomy is almost identical. And the torus is a common, common uh, field effect in our reality. So it emulates from an intelligent mind through the frequencies to support our dimension. Okay. A lot of people who do photography, uh, mm -hmm. doctor, mm -hmm. yeah. um, get these orbs, and they think they're ghosts. Now, mm -hmm. I, I'm somewhat more doubtful. I've done a lot of photography, and uh, I've come up with orbs myself. Yeah. Um, but yeah. usually they're a, an artifact of the flash involved from something, a reflection, something like that. I, I don't know how... You differentiate. Certainly not all things seen as orbs are ghosts or, or souls, that's, right? That's, that's, that's correct. That is correct. And we, over time, like any forensic, uh, you know, any, anyone in forensics will, will see that if it's raining, you have to discount that. If there's snow, you have to throw that out. If there's fog, we have to throw that out. But I have seen these orbs in fog, and they are not raindrops, dewdrops, or whatever. Now... The other thing is, I'm comparing this with video. There is on my website uh, something called Exterior Forces, which is a little mini-series. I have lectures on the paranormal. In episode 10, you'll see 30 minutes of nonstop orbs. And this is you know, real-time video. I slow it down for the observer to see what I'm pointing out. And you will see that these are three-dimensional round objects moving. In inner, you know, amongst the people, uh, flying by the camera, uh, they are not insects. They are not, uh, you know, aberrations. They are, they are, they are intelligent. I was about to say, I used to interview a fellow called Jose Escamilla. Do you know yeah, him? Yeah, 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 you yeah, know, the Rod guy. Yeah. Right, that's right, Rods. Now, he sort of makes the same claim in a way, Doctor. He says, look... Mm -hmm. What I'm photographing, what I'm taking video of, these are not insects. These are living somethings, but but not insects. And in other words, right. he believes that they're entities of some sort. Oh yeah. Have uh, you looked I, into that? His work. I and have looked into that. I cannot find what he finds, but this is an oddity. I don't know how much time we've got. I'll just throw this out real quick. There is a ghost walk in St. Charles. Um, the gentleman who gives the tour is a very good friend of mine, and he goes from site to site and talks about ghosts that may inhabit this place. Yes. Well, when I the, he was with a tour from Canada, I did not know them. They did not know me, and I'm sitting there filming this group as they walk down the street to go from location to location. I see a unique orb traveling with this group, hmm. and now I'm sitting there going, "Wait a minute." Uh, one of these people has either A, a guardian angel, B, a relative that has died recently and still connected to them, or C, um, 
Uh, no. Now, no, when you say you saw an orb traveling with them, do you mean you with your own human eyes you saw it? No, no, not with my human eyes, but ah. with my equipment. With ah, my equipment. okay. What, and your so, equipment uh, is what? Uh, infrared, high definition, black and white, set at the proper frequency to okay. see this energy okay. signature. All right. Okay. Now, we go along. Now, I see this entity again. Um, so I get really curious. And so it seems to be around one particular individual. Okay. I go up to that individual and I said, did you have a relative that died recently? And she said, my father died. And I said, I think he's with you right now. Really? And, the, and I, throughout the rest of the tour, this entity stayed with the group. Now, what I'm trying to get to is when I processed that from videotape into my computer, it looked very similar to a rod, the, the squiggly lines. Mm -hmm. But on my videotape, it didn't. It was a solid white mass moving incredibly fast and maintaining an orbit around this group. Wow. Not only did she say that her father died, her mother was there and gave me the same information. Wow. And and the mother said she was his favorite favorite child because they had several children. Of course. Um so okay. so there you have it. You know, right. you have now it. here here's another question for you since you know so much about the other side and this process. Um <laughs> See how can I put this? Um does a ghost after a period of time find their way or does their lack of faith, I guess would be a way to put it, uh, that you claim keeps them here in the first place, um, have an opportunity to change and, and have them move on, or are they yes. eternally here? No, no. no, no. The, the whole idea is that um, uh, they have to accept. The, if, they, if a person hates themselves so much, they'll never accept love. They'll never be... They'll never think they're good enough for love, and especially unconditional love. So, Unconditional it, love shouldn't care. Well, no, but let's say you don't think highly of yourself. Yes. So I'm not going to accept that unconditional love because I'm not worth it. I'm not worth it. You see I see. So you, you lay in judgment of yourself. Bingo. Exactly. And Daniel Brinkley has always said, he said two things to me one time. He says, you will always judge yourself, and you'll see yourself in 3D being uh, the biggest ass of your life, because you'll get a past life review. Terrifying. You can't have a 3D image, okay, because you're dead, right? Mm. But somehow the universe in the uh, Akashic Records or the Hall of Libraries remembers your life individually in 3D. Hmm. It can't do that unless it has an, uh, an analog memory. Hmm. Now, now, how can all this take place? We have 10,000 to 40,000 people with near-death experiences almost on a daily basis. Yes, we do. And they come back and say amazing things. Some do. To, yeah, some do. I've listened to some of them, put them on YouTube, and I, 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 I've watched you know, some with amazing, um, amazing fascination. But what they kind of talk about is that they are in a real place, mm -hmm. a real place that exists in three dimensions. Yes. And they remember themselves, but slightly younger and better looking. Yes. Okay. You ha to have a memory, you have to have a loop. You have to have a loop. Now, um, if you have a torus field that's rotating. But, but, but a loop, uh, Doctor, a loop, and I've heard that theory with, regarding ghosts before, a loop is just that. It's a loop. Ph.D., studied, studying uh, parapsychology for 27 years. Now, uh, some people are ripping them apart over here, a couple anyway, on the wormhole, 
uh, because of the reference to Zillion, it was metaphoric. Of course, there's no such thing as Zillion. Please, folks, come on, bear with us here. Just unmeasurable. Think of it that way, right, uh, Doctor? Exactly, because it's a fractal design. Yeah. And so the further you go into it, the further it looks, and you can go to almost infinity. So the, the idea is it's metaphorical. It's just a saying that it's incredibly large and it's filled with energy, and it has you know trillions and trillions of different frequencies that are in that energy. Now, how all this becomes consciousness is a very unique digital problem. Every human has genes, a genetic code, and every gene has a frequency. This frequency, whatever it's resonating at, is where the energy of the afterlife creates this consciousness to interface with that genetic code. Okay. All right, all right, all right. So when before the break, we were talking about loops, and boy, have I heard a lot about yeah. this with respect mm -hmm. to ghosts. It, it seems to me... Uh, and a lot of people have noticed loops. In other words, uh, in a house that's haunted or near a haunted area, the ghost appears to do the same thing again and again and again and again. And uh, to me, that's either not associated with consciousness as we understand it, or it's hell. Because to be condemned to do the same thing again and again and again is hell. We all have that private thing. Now, uh, when you study like post-traumatic stress, there is something that's like a psychological wall that some people just can't get through. They just can't overcome. And this is a trauma. It's a psychological trauma. Now, whatever it is, this person becomes ashamed of not only their weakness, but of the trauma itself. So they cannot get past it. And that becomes what we would call uh, a living hell. Now, when you die, the trauma is revealed to you in 3D. And if you can't get past it then, then that is what we'd call a hell. Because you live that loop over and over, and you can't break your cycle. You can't get out of it. So you're, you you're saying that you're absolutely sure that... In that loop, there is a consciousness suffering it again and again and again. Again, exactly. And and, and, and this occurs most frequently when there is a, a violent death of some sort. Yeah, suicide, violence, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Really? Murder. You know, uh, um, there is a uh, place uh, in uh, Tombstone, Arizona, called the Bird Cage. Yes. And uh, they almost kicked me out of there. <laughs> But anyway, uh, I went on the tour there, and we saw several ghosts there. I proved all of their artifacts that were there. Now, at the end of the tour, we had a little seance. All right. Well, there is an entity in the birdcage, in Tombstone, that can try to somehow communicate through a speaker, a stereo speaker. Really? That it, that has no connection. It's just bare wires at the end of it. There's a speaker sitting there, and you'll hear this static come across it. This is the entity shorting out the speaker wires and applying just enough current to it that it actually uh, sounds like you know static interference, and it's not plugged into anything. This entity is called Timothy or Timmy. I'm not really sure which one it was. Anyway, during the seance at the and, end of the tour... And you know this how? The name? Um, the, the lady who led the tour uh, is psychic. Ah. And she she claims that she has seen several full-blown bodied entities early in the morning at that location, walking around like they owned the place, dressed in clothing from a period a hundred years ago. Wow. Now, she was leading the tour, she was convinced it's haunted, and she can hear, she's some type of audio, clero, uh, audio cleric, where she can uh, hear the, the voices, and there is this one that remains there at the birdcage, and it's either Timothy or Timmy, I can't, I, I don't remember which, but anyway, we were having the seance, and I had my equipment 
uh, there. And I noticed one entity, but mm-hmm. hang around. There was another one that attacked a gentleman who was sitting across from me. And so we had to break the seance circle. I picked up my equipment, and I watched as this orb, again, plasma, leave the back of his neck. The back of his neck. And he was choking. We thought he was just uh, nervous. And then suddenly he lost all ability, uh, neuromuscular ability in his throat to even say that he was in pain. He was actually being choked or he felt like something was choking him. Well, I'm watching this on my camera, and and I see this orb eject itself out of the back of his neck, and even in different stages of slow motion, it was dramatic. There was no uh, physical cause, because all of her hands, okay, there's no one there to choke him, because all of her hands are connected. But when I videotape this, I realize that if that is Timmy or Timothy or whomever that is there, was using him to to try to communicate, use his vocal cords, however, Uh through a neuromuscular sense. Now, this guy, let me tell you a little bit about this guy. He was a a soldier. He was going off to Afghanistan in 10 days. And him and his girlfriend came down to go to the birdcage just as tourists. So... This guy is a straightforward, honest shooter. It took me 30 minutes after that, after that to calm him down, to try to tell him that it wasn't his fault, that he was attacked, and he was attacked by an entity that he could not see or defend himself against. And after that, he kind of said, okay. And then he said, you know, in 10 days I'll be in Afghanistan. So, um, so he was not... Uh, you know, a fly by night, excitable type. He was he was a trained soldier. All right. Uh, I have had people tell me, uh, Doctor, that it is possible to trap an entity, or if you will, trap a ghost, um, trap a soul. Uh, depending on how you want to look at yeah. this, I guess uh, they could all be one and the same. But but you yeah. can actually trap something. Is that true? No. No, that is not. We tried for years. We were able. We were able to design a machine, but it's like Ghostbusters. The more you throw in there, the bigger the field to maintain it has to be. Well, yeah, but I, I would think one would be okay. I mean, if you can trap <laughs> one entity, yeah. you can prove a lot, right? Oh, true, true. You could prove everything. So you're telling you me that, like in Ghostbusters, you would need an electromagnetic um, a field contain to actually correct. contain it? Right. Contain it, correct. Because it would have to be a stronger electromagnetic uh, field than the plasma field that it is in. So after you do these readings, you know, we decided that it was easier to keep an entity out by reversing certain polarities using a generator. We could wire a room, very similar like a cage or Faraday cage or whatever, and we could reverse the polarity and keep them out easier than we could ever keep them in. Well, it makes a nice safe room, I suppose, from, from yes, entities. Yes. But other other than that, um, I don't know. I kind of like the idea, perverse as it may be, of capturing something. Yeah, we've tried that, and the expense and the time and the coaxing became problematic. And so we we didn't really give up on it. We actually have a design. You know, it's like capturing anything in the analog world, you just have to have the right design and you have to have some assistance. So it was easier for us to um, – now, this is where we get into a little um, situation. And it's not belief. Believe you me, it's not belief. Some people say we can go on ghost hunts and we are never attacked. Nothing ever happens to us. Right. And we always come back with a photo or whatever of a ghost or, you know, orb or whatever. And I say, yes, that's fine. But why aren't you possessed? And they just look at me like they're like stunned. They've never come across their mind before. And I said, well, either two things, you you know, the ghost didn't want to possess you, or you have some type of angelic guidance that is preventing you from being possessed. And so we developed a suit. It was kind of like a... 
<laughs> well, actually, I have, we, we built the vest. And what it is, it's very fine uh, wiring that's built into some type of capacitor. And as the entity drags electrons, because electrons really affect us in this reality, the, as they drag the electrons, the suit picks up the electrons and puts it in a capacitor. So it, those things don't affect us. They, they can't turn our reality against us. So you're saying you can, you, you can actually suck a soul into a capacitor, which, well, of course, yes. hold, holds yeah. a charge. Which would hold a charge. So what we're doing is we're bleeding off. We could virtually bleed off a, a lot of it, uh, a lot of that energy. Now, we couldn't really maintain it, but we could bleed it off. So an entity like this gentleman who was scratched, uh, that would have been preventable with the with the proper suit he could he could have worn it we actually came up with a halo in essence you're grounding them out right exactly exactly we're just grounding them out using plain physics just to ground out their effect on us now um this gets into a different field but um we had actually worked up the you know schematics for all this and then it got to a point to where we had to um, kind of enlist the um, enlist the help of a psychic because we were getting into a point of saying, you know, are we becoming adversarial? I don't want to become adversarial. I just want to be, uh, you know, pleasant with these entities. I don't want something to attack me that I can't see. Or right, but don't. how do you, if you're looking for a psychic, how do you decide uh, the real McCoy versus all the frauds and fakes? Yeah. Um, well, after you worked with one for 20 years, you, I guess, yeah. you, you get to know them pretty well, and you get to know what they can do. And so once you get into what their specialty is, and they can pull information to you through that specialty. So, you know, I, if, I, if I hurt my, my knee, I don't go to a cardiac surgeon, you know. Right. I go to a kinesiology guy who's going to tell me right. about my knee. Mm -hmm. So... So you work with their ability, whatever that ability may be, to download information that you may be overlooking. There might be a better way. That's the idea of using a, a proper professional psychic is to save time, save money, and try to uh, lock in on on how this is all working out. And um, it makes sense like, to me. I mean, I, I know there are people who have the ability to um, mm -hmm. either call up or communicate with. Uh, those on the other side. Uh, there are some people who really can do that, and then there's a bunch of fakes. So, yes, yes, yes. I, I agree. I agree. I'm right there with you. So I happen to have bumped into one, um, you know, as serendipity or synchronicity happens. I bumped into one, and she was just kind of, you know, a natural born. She was naturally born. This was the way she was all of her life. She was a registered nurse. She had become a certified hypnotherapist. She had her own client base and things like this, but she wasn't uh, aggressively seeking clients. So I, after a situation, a period of kind of getting used to each other's uh, methods of operation, mm -hmm. we realized we realized very quickly that we had to uh, double up. So if I have one colleague who's a still photography specialist, someone else in the team had to become a specialist in still photography. If someone was a video editor and expert, someone else in the team had to, so we could always back each other up. But when it came to the psychic situation, we only had one. So we, we had to trust that one. Now, um, I had a... The, uh, the proof is in the pudding, of course. So yeah. if your psychic yeah. can produce information saying, look, there's something here, and then you right. otherwise prove there is something there, pretty yes. good. That's it. So when we go into a house and she says there are six entities here, and I have videotaped or taken still photography and I've captured four, I know we're in the ballpark. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're in the ballpark. You know what I'm saying? So if she says they've left the house, then we will go outside. Mm -hmm. And nine times out of ten, we were investigating a school. Uh, it's supposed to have been haunted. Uh, we would get in there. We don't find anything. I'm with another team. They can't find anything. And I just say, okay, if they're not inside, they're outside. So we walk outside, and there they are. These orbs are right outside. 
Uh, we're not only getting them on still cameras, we're getting them on video equipment. We walk back in, they follow us back in, hmm. and there they are. So, so you know... Um, I've always been an orb skeptic. I'm sorry. But I, know, I have been. I know, I know. Uh, on I the other hand, on the other hand, what you've captured, yeah. uh, I'm impressed by. I mean, you, yeah. you've got something different there. I don't know what you've got, but it's very different. Now, now I'm going to, I'm going to draw a little picture here. Okay. Now we have the Max Planck Institute of how the universe is diagrammed, and it looks exactly like the human brain's neural network. Hmm. Okay, so the entire universe is electromagnetically connected, just like the human brain. Not only just like, it is exactly like. So, if you're really telepathic, or if you're really psychic, you can jump on this galactic superhighway and go to your power station sitting off 1,500 light years away mm -hmm. and tell you exactly what it is. Why are we sending spaceships into space or whatever when if we had the right psychic, the right capability, even technical remote viewing has evolved to a certain extent. We could be looking, NASA, NASA could say, here is the planet, one, two, three, go, and technical remote viewers could come back with more data than ever. I had an, uh, a friend of mine who was a NASA scientist, uh, work, worked on the space shuttle program, and we were on a radio show together. And he pulled out the latest planet that NASA had found, and it was just slightly larger than Earth. And um, But they could not figure out if it had life on it or what was going on. And? Well, he laid it down on the table, and I said, okay, I'll look at that. So uh, I have recently become a very good dowser. And so I doused if our life could live on that planet. And the answer was no. Okay. Yeah. Then a few more questions later, it comes back that the sun in that solar system is giving off lethal radiation to our type of life form. Okay. And that planet would not be, could not be colonized by us because we could not survive on the surface. Right. Okay, fine. But um, th th that doesn't mean some other life doesn't survive there and thrive there. True, that's true. But to save time, instead of sending a spaceship out there, which would take years, um, we can send psychics first. Find the planets that are perfect for our life form. Well, that's a good point. I, you know, some remote, uh, some remote viewers are full of um, baloney. Uh, other remote viewers are spot on. And uh, you and I talked for a moment before the show, and of all the seers that I've had on my radio program, Evelyn Paglini, uh, who claimed to be a witch, she has now passed on, hit everything on the mark. I mean everything that she said she saw coming. Brother, you, you could take it to the bank. It was coming. And I know you heard her, right? Yes, I remember that show. That woman that was astounding. All right, yeah. hold it right there. We've got a break coming up, short one. I'm Art Bell. Dr. Michael Lynch is my guest. In the desert, via Skype, worldwide, if on a computer, please be sure to use a headphone mic and call MITD51. That's MITD51. That's it. All right, um, let me give you the, uh, the quick talk, and then uh, we're going to begin to take some calls. There are some people I, I know, uh, doctor, that are going to think you're a lunatic. <laughs> Absolutely crazy for thinking these things, and others not so much. It depends, I guess, on what you believe. So here we go. My public number is area code 952-225-5278. That's area code 952-225-5278. Not so much a lunatic, though, if you look at the photographs that he's got. That's, uh, that's pretty telling stuff. And then if you want to come in by Skype, uh, you can come in that way as well. Uh, in North America, simply add us as a contact, and then we'll be on your contact list. So a uh, little plus sign on Skype, you would uh, uh, put MITD51. 
M-I-T-D-S, Midnight in the Desert 5-1. And elsewhere in the world, M-I-T-D-5-5, M-I-T-D-5-5. And we do have a first-time caller line. Let me dig it out here. And a, uh, let's see, our first-time caller line is area code 775-285-5800. Area code 775-285-5800. I know there's a lot of people out there that look at orbs and uh, believe in orbs, and I have not been one of them. But I must say, uh, what uh, the doctor has captured on film here seems to me to be a very different uh, sort of animal. Now, I had my producer uh, look, Doctor, for uh, the the, the, um, uh, the uh, sound you talked about. The, the I think it was sort of a grunt or a scream you, you mentioned that was on your website. Uh, no, no, no. It's not on my website. It's on the uh, radio station's website. At, oh. Uh, 971talk.com, yeah. And it's under uh, the Dave Glover Show or DGS Halloweens. And uh, I'm sorry, that's owned by the you know the copyrights on the oh. radio station's website. No, I see. I'm All right. Kidding. All right. Well, then yeah. scratch that idea. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, but next time, if we do another show on EVPs, I'll definitely get their permission, and we'll run some EVPs. There's another thing about this. Um, we were doing an investigation, and I was shooting off some photography, and I caught a couple of orbs. And immediately, I took the microphone, which was a wireless microphone, uh, during this show, and I raised it up to the air, and I said, if there's anyone in the room who would like to talk to us, go right ahead, and now's your opportunity. And, uh, well, everybody got upset because they thought I was hogging the show, and when they played the tape back, there were two voices on the recording exactly. So those dust specs were talking to me, <laughs> which I don't think so. Or they knew English and they were they were speaking. They were speaking directly into the microphone. Huh. So odd, odd indeed. Um, certain paradigms we have to shift to gain better perspective. You know, it's just one of those things. How is the soul, or if you will, a consciousness created in the first place? In the afterlife, there is so much energy and there is so many frequencies that the frequencies have to set up to, with our genes. And so those frequencies are selected for our genetic profile. And that energy is inserted as we become a vessel. Uh, 21 days before we're actually born, our consciousness 21 is days. inserted yeah, into our genetic makeup. And so we are born with the consciousness for those genes. And this is where we get into a lot of debate on is it nature or nurture? Is it, sure. you know, epigenetics or is it something else? You know, is it handed down? If you have an abnormality in through genes, is it handed down and mm -hmm. things like that? All right. Well, here's another one for you, uh, doctor. And so it has to do with, uh, with reincarnation. The Buddhists mm -hmm. firmly believe in reincarnation. Mm -hmm. I also mm -hmm. believe that um, when a person dies, it seems as though their presence or what, whatever they are, their soul, seems to remain in the area for a certain amount of time, typically three or four days, and then they do move on. Um, have you heard anything like that? Yes, um, I've heard I've heard var variations of stories. I've heard that sometimes it's every hundred years a person gets reincarnated, and I've heard. Uh, it being within a few years. And in India, uh, there was a little girl not too long ago who came out and said she was one of the astronauts who died in the space shuttle incident. Um, she actually knew her father's name. She knew uh -huh. the village where she lived. And she was, uh, you know, less than five or six years old. Yes, uh, that matches up so well with a recent movie called I Origins. Did you see that? No, I haven't seen that yet. Oh, oh my. <laughs> you should see that, trust me. Um, all right, let's let's go quickly to Skype and take a start to take calls. Hello there, you're on the air with uh, Dr. Lynch. Skype. Hello, Skype. Hello. Yes, hi. Hi, Art. Gentlemen, yes. good evening. Good evening. 
Um, so I wanted to share an experience that I've uh, been having. I had at one point heard you talk about the refresh rate on screen monitors yes, and how that can affect perception. Right. So I built some LCD glasses that can vary the blink rate, and I've been playing with those, and some very strange things have been happening. Such as? Synchronicity, but continual, like things happening that are so beyond the possibility of coincidence. And um, another thing that happened is... Well, you haven't told me yet what happened. Things that are so beyond coincidence. What do you mean? Well, for example, I would mention something, and it would manifest itself in some totally unrelated way shortly thereafter. For example, I'd mention something to my wife, and it would happen. I would do something, and something would happen that's related, but no no way uh, they're connected, hmm. if that makes sense. But the second thing, the disturbing thing is... Um, a couple of days ago, um, I went into our house. I was working in the backyard, and I couldn't find my wife. And I said, that's strange. Where did she go? And I went back in the kitchen, and she was sitting there. And I said, oh, where were you? She says, well, I've been sitting here all the time. And I thought, well, that's odd. The next morning, um, I woke up, and for a brief second, I saw an entity standing uh, standing beside me, and a brief fraction of a second later it was that it was as, as if i reawoke the fabric in the background changed and that entity was gone all right uh and well this very is very weird yes but. very weird indeed all right well thank you for the call and uh, the story um doctor i had a recent experience uh it was i don't know weeks before i actually began doing this program in july that uh, that i'll describe to you briefly and uh, you can make of it what you will. Um, I, I was working, and this is why he mentioned what he mentioned. I was working late at night on my computer, and I was doing research for this show coming up. You know, I knew I was about to be on the air in July. So sitting at my computer for hours late at night after my family had long gone to bed, hours and hours in front of that computer uh, looking up stories and things, and all of a sudden on my right, I saw what was a human figure shape, Doctor, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it started. It startled me really badly. It scared me, and I it blinked away. And I I looked behind me. Why I don't know, but there it was behind me. At this point, I'm terrified. I mean, really terrified. I swung back to the left, and oh my God, it's right there to the left of me, and then gone, and. It, it, it really didn't have, you know, appendages to it, but it was a human form, head, mm-hmm. torso, something where the legs should be. I don't know what this thing was. I call it a shadow person. I guess we can call it whatever you want to call it. Um, what is a shadow person anyway? Uh, uh, basically, a shadow person is what, something that's absorbing light energy, and that's why they look like a shadow. They're darker. They're absorbing light, and they're not reflecting light. Is it a ghost? Yeah, we have to walk a fine line here. Now, okay, everybody thinks I'm on the crazy side anyway. So let's say it's not a ghost. Then what would it be? And then it would be a psychic projection of an entity. So let's say there is someone incredibly telepathic or remote viewer, and accidentally they're viewing you. Why is it not? They, I'm sorry. Why is it not as likely to be a ghost? Is it because no, of no, this no. energy deal, or yeah? Be, be, okay. On the flip side, let's say it's a ghost. Okay, if it was, it would be able to, at that size of energy, to memorize this entire body, should be able to move something, it should be able to reappear, and at later dates, 
um, you know, be not. interactive, be more interactive. Now you have some wanderers that just, you know, wander through the neighborhood <laughs> and they just move on. I'm not seeking have... this stuff, doctor. Uh, I don't. No, no, you don't have to. No, it's curious about you. It's just curious <laughs> about you. You know, here's Art Bell, legendary radio announcer. Oh, come let's on. See, let's look over each, let's look over his shoulder and see what he's looking at and, you know, uh, curiosity on the other side is very uh, is very curious. We used to go to this one uh, place, which was incredibly haunted, and we would open the door. We'd have to start videotaping when we opened the door. Uh, and as we opened the door, the two little balls of light would be sitting right there waiting for us. And then within a few minutes, they were gone. They didn't care about us anymore. We weren't exciting enough for them or whatever. And so um, they'll meet you at the door. They're curious. All right. They're um, really curious. Let, we're in the final hour here. Let's take uh, a call. Spartanburg, South Carolina, I believe. Hello, Lord. How are you today? I'm okay, sir. You're on the air. Uh, yes, sir. Just wanted to let the gentleman know, or I had a question. Uh, I saw a full-bodied entity, and I didn't know that that was possible, but it stands over along Interstate 40 in Tennessee, and I'm an uh, amateur radio operator also, and when you drive by this entity, and this has happened many times, I can actually hear the entity on the twenty meter and eighty meter bands, and I, you know, I knew that they just communicate electronically. You're hearing them uh, on the radio, really? Yeah, oh, oh, right on the HL, and I never knew that this was possible. I've well, there's the, I know there's some evil entities on seventy five meters. No question about that. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you totally, exactly. <laughs> All but, right. Uh, yeah. I just wanted his opinion of that. I just never knew a full body could do that. Okay. Well, um, so, Doctor, uh, they can project themselves, if they can project themselves to a recorder and become an EVP, then it seems to me they could project themselves to the radio, to the radio spectrum if they wanted to, right? Absolutely. There are something like a police scanner that scans hundreds of frequencies. And um, you can run this uh, apparatus, and it will start to scan. And when it hits a frequency, you may get several words. You may get a couple. Um, I've seen this apparatus actually work. They call different names, the ghost box or ghost antenna and things like that. And as it scans, you'll actually be able to pick up certain conversations. Other people have tried to narrow in the frequencies, but sometimes they change per entity to entity. There is something called, um, I forget what the, tr the name of it is, is some triangle out east, and if you drive through it, you'll see apparitions along the side of the road. Sometimes they're Native American Indians or they're uh, the red coats, you know, from a different time. There is also the ancient story of uh, Resurrection Mary, where she comes out of the cemetery in Chicago, mm -hmm. and she'll be walking alongside the road, and people will pick her up, think she's absolutely real, deliver her, and she disappears. Okay, Doctor, um, I, it's not that I want to see anything. Um, thank you very much. Um, however, it was my theory that staring at that computer screen for that long period of time affected me that the refresh rate of the uh, uh, the computer screen affected my brain after a while. Now, that's just a wild no, that, that's theory. That's true. It's hypnosis, a form of hypnosis. The 60 cycles or the 120 cycles uh, form in the, the mind, the subconscious brain, and you start becoming uh, – hypersensitive to suggestion and auto suggestion. A that was just people. my theory. Okay, listen, yeah. a, a lot of no, people not... a lot of I I'm somebody who doesn't want to find these things because I'd rather not see them, thank you. But if somebody actually wants to find a ghost doctor, what yeah. is the best advice you can give those who would wish to actually see Um it? you would have to go to some place that's public and that advertises that they're haunted and then you could take your equipment with you. Um, like I said, sometimes a steel camera is better than a video camera if you don't have the right frequencies. But that's the way you kind of get started. I don't recommend going to cemeteries. But uh, Why? With my equipment, uh, at night they have certain regu re you know, restrictions. 
and I've been to several at night, and I don't get a lot of evidence. I get more evidence walking down the street, like I got more evidence walking down the street of Tombstone, Arizona, than I did inside the birdcage. You know, that's really, really interesting, because... The best EVP people I know also say they don't get their best evidence in cemeteries. They go to places like prisons, yes, they, um, you, you know, places where... The loop. Uh, yeah. The you loop. get caught in that loop. You can't forgive yourself. You're not good enough. And you have to stay in that prison because you just can't pass that reality. So <laughs> what do you hear? You hear the same things over and over they're, they're new conversations, but you get that EVP because they can't break out. See, that that is legitimately scary to me, to imagine yeah. being caught in a loop and then you're with, with consciousness yourself, doing the same damn thing again and again yeah, and again. Yeah, yeah. You can't forgive yourself. So when someone comes around, you're in my space, they become territorial or predatorial. And so normally when you're like in a prison or uh, an asylum, they become very predatorial. Uh, and territorial, so they'll almost want you off their property, and they'll look, they'll do whatever they can. I mean, I think in in certain cases, uh, not to step on Barry Taft's toes, but I had a case where a lady was being sexually assaulted by an entity, and we could videotape the entity, so we knew it was there. Um, what shocked her was she thought it was all a psychosis until we actually showed her the videotape of the entity in her bedroom oh my God. Her, she got home. And and so we had to... You're you know, again, telling me you have video of this? Uh, yeah, I, I've got it in my library. I mean, I've got years. I, we've, ever since 2000, we have, you know, and then prior to that, we we experimented on frequencies in order to see this. So what... So we get into certain private matters, you might say, that, that uh, you know, I can't reveal names or locations, but we get into certain situations that don't make any sense to us. But if you're just free-flowing energy and you're caught in the, you know, self-ridicule, self-hatred, you'll never break out. You'll never break that loop. And that's why when you go to these prisons, you go to these asylums, they're minds can't forgive themselves. Okay, well, apparently that is a good hunting location if you really want to find these things. JN on Skype, hello. Hello, Art Bell. This is Jeremy in uh, Aransas Pass. Uh, thanks for having me on, Art Bell. I've been listening to you since uh, 94, 95, <laughs> and uh, this is my first time to get to talk to you, so I'm really excited. Uh, Mr. Doc. Uh, Lynch, great uh, yeah. show tonight, man. I'm really enjoying it a lot. Uh, a quick little thing, and then I'll let you get on with some other people. I'm sure there's plenty of people who like to talk to you. Uh, when I was young and uh, we had this ranch out in Goliad, um, I used to wake up a lot of times with scratch marks all over my stomach. Now, when mm -hmm. I was a kid, I, I never told nobody that because I was more or less scared. You know, and I know it wasn't from playing or something like that, but I remember him being almost like, you know, five, five, the, you know, fingers, which you would notice, and they'd be like on my stomach and on my... Caller, let, let me ask yeah. you this. Um, did you feel it happen to you at the moment it oh. happened, or only when you woke up did you see this stuff? Yeah, only when I woke up. It was like, you know, I, I, I never felt it in the night, you know. Huh. It was always like whenever I woke up the next day, and it was only when I went to the ranch. It was only when I went up there and we spent the time at the ranch with my grandparents and stuff. I, it never happened to me like at my house where we lived. It was always only at the ranch, and, you know, I know it wasn't from playing because I was a pretty careful kid. You know, I would remember these scratches, but I, I just remember him being, you know, the size of a hand, and they would be on my stomach, and they would be something Sometimes on my chest, and even I think sometimes on my back. But I would just like to get Mr. Uh, uh, Lynch's uh, 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 retrospect Lynch. on that. Okay. And, uh, Do I, Dr. I, I Lynch. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. That entity was trying to get your attention and not trying to lethally harm you. So that entity was in that room while you were there all the time. Mm. Now, you don't have the ability. We're not telepathic. We don't have the ability to find out what they really wanted, but they were just trying to nudge you to get your attention for some reason. All right, well, it sure gets my attention. Um, yes. You know, some of what we talk about, yeah, you know, you can either believe it or not believe it, but when you, when you have these scratches, I mean, really bad, bad scratches, uh, as depicted uh, on, on our website, the photograph you sent, 
Mm-hmm. My God, I, you know, that just doesn't come from nothing. Or in this case, sort of in, in a way, I guess it does. Um, let's go to Silverdale, Washington. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I just want hi. Hi, Art. Um, hello, Dr. Lynch. I wanted to say um, years ago I took a class with a lady, and, and during the class, uh, psychic class, she was talking about the fact that her father, she would go to the Akashic Records at night for the class, and she said she'd always see her father who had passed. He was a French soldier, and he had passed years before. And he was laying there always with the, looked like angels around him working on him, and she'd see him every night, and they would reassure her he'd be all right. And she told our class one time about it, and uh, I just got kind of guided, uh, we'll work on him tonight by my guides. And the next morning when we went to our class, she said the most wonderful thing had happened. She said he had uh, come that night, and it's the only time he'd ever done it, and he sat on her bed and said he was fine now, and they conversed a little bit, and then he left. And she oh. said, I know he's fine. And she said, I didn't see him laying there that night in the Akashic Records on the way to the Akashic Records. So I think he probably needed to forgive himself for something that happened during the war is what she felt, too. Hmm. So it was, it was yes. probably, a, probably uh, a matter of forgiveness. Yeah, the odd thing is is that there's a lot of things that we talk about, like angels and miracles, and the the Vatican has a whole room of these things. Um, we we look at them very lightly, but at the same time, the energy to do this is 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 out there, and it's it's a medium, it's a matrix of energy that's that's fueling not only this reality, it's fueling this reality in a way that our conscious mind is looking at it. And then we can alter it if we so desire. So to to, to have a psychoanalysis on the other side with angels or superior beings or guides, I say absolutely. I say why not? <laughs> you know, and we may be totally embarrassed once we get on the other side of, you know, our our lifestyle or our lives or whatever. But at the same time, if we can forgive ourselves, accept the, this next this next life, then we we are reimmersed in that energy, and we are reconnected on the same level. So my energy is absorbed back in. And all my memories come back. I can go back to all my past lives, all my future lives, if I so desire. It, it becomes infinite, infinite, infinite time, infinite space, because you're nothing but energy. If we look at the process, even Einstein said, if you're at the speed of light, time stops. Well, if you're just pure energy, electricity, if you're just pure electricity, you have no time, zero time. It's when you drop out of that is when Linear time. Okay, that makes yeah, sense. I mean, time. earlier you were yeah. saying zillion, and that doesn't well, work. Yes, but I mean, time. you're talking about yeah. infinity, basically. Or you... In, yes, yeah. let's just say, say infinity. Yeah. So, so when you start looking at that and the infinite energy that's backing that up, and how that, uh, you know, connects to the genetic code in your body, the the genetic uh, matrix then we start to see that we're interconnected. We're in a medium of, of, of not sub, we're in subatomic energy, we're in subatomic plasmas, and this is a, a benevolent, gentle energy. But, okay, you're throwing around a lot of phrases that I don't yeah. understand. Genetic okay. matrix. Okay, yeah, no, I hate to say that we, we're back in the Cold War, but there is a Russian scientist, a Russian um, biophysicist who's talking about molecular biology and he's talking about the dna and how it resonates and that they think in russia now that by using certain dna frequencies they can cure genetic wait a minute what's a dna frequency well we all are resonating we all our dna is resonating at frequencies related to our body our genetic code our genetic blueprint and the Russians think that they can use other frequencies, energy plasma frequencies probably, yeah. and they can correct DNA or manipulate DNA or genes at a sub, you know, at, at the cellular level. So there's other people looking at this, and 
if we're all resonating, that means we're harmonic. Now, I was in Europe, and I went to this um, museum for harps. And I, I was just amazed at these harps, uh, and these people were playing these harps and, in a symphony. You're leading me and all I, over the place here. I, I'm not... Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tie it up. So these harps are resonating strings, and if each part of my oh. gene is a resonating string, we are a symphony of vibration, a symphony of energy. Yeah, I'm going to actually have a, a guest on uh, audio energy. It's a very, very interesting subject. Uh, Ch- somebody named Chaz on Skype very quickly. Hi. Hey, Art. Hey, uh, Doctor. I'm calling from Vegas. Um, quick question. You see all of these shows on TV where these investigators are going out and they're investigating prisons and right. uh, asylums and that type of thing, but none of them ever talk about the possible... Um, attachments that these ghosts or entities or whatever could attach to them and go home with them and cause havoc. I can take my answer off the air, but what are your thoughts on that? Um, uh, God blesses the naive mind. (laughs) I'm just going to say they are incredibly fortunate if they don't take something home with them or something doesn't follow them home. And... um, and that is something that... Now, now I'm with you. I, I think that... Um, I, I've been warning a friend uh, who's using this program, this app, to, to find ghosts. It's like, in my mind, it's like using a Ouija board. Mm-hmm. You're going to invite something into your life, and you're not sure what you're inviting into your life, and you may not be able to uninvite it from your life. In other words... Once you get something hanging around you, you've said it yourself, those those orbs, those energy balls, whatever they are, those spirits may not leave. Uh, once you invite them in, they may not leave, like a bad guest at night. Speaking of the Ouija board, I, uh, later on this week, will be doing uh, going back to the Exorcist House in St. Louis. Uh-huh. And the, um, that's a story within itself. All right. Well, it's a story that will have to wait. We've got a break coming up. Well, okay. My guest is Dr. Michael Lynch, and he's been investigating neuropsychology and these kind of events for 27 years. 27 years. That's a very long time. And uh, he's pretty well convinced these orbs that people see are the real McCoy. Now, the orbs that he showed in the photographs, I think, are astounding. They're not like the orbs I've seen, just the light blobs that you see in photographs. And a lot of people believe in those. Anyway, if you want to join us, national number is area code 952-225-5278. The first-time caller line is uh, area code 775-285-5800. 775 5800, and of course on Skype at MITD51 or MITD55. Uh, and Doctor, you're back on the air again. Yes. Um, okay, let's uh, explore what we've got on the phone for you. And on the first time caller line, you are on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. Hi. I am a huge fan. I just want to say I'm so happy that you're back. Um, but. I uh, just wanted to call in and talk about attachments for a moment. Attachments? Um, you mean like to email? Yeah. Well, no. No, not those, huh? <laughs> the the spooky <laughs> ones that I was unaware of until I, I had one. Um, I was, uh, your um, guest was mentioning, um, you know, locations such as, you know, uh, prisons or things like that. This is, a you know, our regular hospital where you're hospitalized and (laughs) your stay, you know, isn't very comfortable depending on what you're there for. But I I had an emergency surgery and ended up being there for a couple days and something came home with me and I didn't realize it until, you know, weeks later I had uh, just a, a lot of depression and I didn't know why I felt really gloomy. And anyways, uh, it took, uh, to quite the toll on what do you, how do you out. know excuse me how do you know something came with you how do you what, well i did, i didn't know it at first it, it took some it took some time for me to realize cuz i i kept questioning myself and wondering why 
why I would feel a certain way or, or these mood changes. And, and it really wasn't until I was actually revisiting one of your shows with uh, Malachi Martin. Yes. And, and uh, he was talking a lot about, you know, your mood and, and, and people who can, you know, feel energy or negative energy and those sorts of, of emotions that can take over, um, you know, even just with... So energy. this wasn't even close to the normal you. No, it just felt like, I mean, part of me was is present, you know, like I am right now, but some of these emotions would come over me and I just was wondering where it was coming from and, and eventually, you know, I, I found out by uh, meeting with a person who had a lot of, of uh, you know, I guess psychic ability and, and, you know, asked me questions and it took a lot of digging, but when, when, you know, I found that out, it was a little scary. It was like, you know, that ride at Disneyland where a ghost follows you home. Yeah, so, so how did you get away from this or did you? Well, I, I did. Um, it took, it took a lot of energy just to basically what it is, is, you know, we are all lights and we are all, you know, energy and, and, I think what happens possibly is when someone isn't ready to go and they're, you know, in the hospital and, you know, they have that moment of being released from their body, you know, they yes. perhaps they're stuck there and they're trapped or maybe, you know, they're trying to find that light in other people and they attach to it. And, and Dr. Doctor, um, let, let's ask, Doctor, if you're close to somebody, for example, in the hospital, and they pass away, is it possible they attach to you? Yes. Yes, it is. Now, sometimes that's not necessarily true. Many people who die in the hospital are, no one ever dies alone. There is always someone standing by, right. a relative, yes. angel, whatever. But sometimes they just can't give up that mortal coil. And so they will attach to someone who is healing because the energy from the wound somewhat bleeds out to repair the skin, repair the body, and they can survive off of that. I've got an interesting story. It is spooky. Wow. Uh, that uh, a friend of mine who's also a partner in my, my organization, she hypnotized a gentleman who had chronic shoulder pain. Um, she hypnotized him and pulled him kind of out of his body to look around psychically. Mm -hmm. And noticed that there was an attachment on his shoulder where he was receiving that pain. Wow. And, and then um, she said, okay, if there's anyone from the other side who would like to come and get this attachment and take him to the other side, please do. And then she asked the gentleman, what is happening now? And he said, well, under hypnosis, he said, God called his name, and he went into the light. The man came out of hypnosis, didn't um, remember anything, because she erases that memory. Let me guess, and the pain was gone. Exactly. Now, this wow. also happened with, with another patient who swore up and down she had arthritis in her uh, ankle, and she had a brace on it, and her doctor said, you have arthritis. After hypnosis and after an entity detachment, she got up and walked out. After an entity detachment. Okay. Detachment. Okay, yeah. ma'am. Thank you very much for the call. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Take care. Yeah. Um, okay. So those kind of attachments are not only possible, but, uh, and uh, I mean, what if you work in a hospital, if you're a nurse or a doctor, yeah. how do you avoid such attachments? <laughs> I do. I don't know. I don't know. But my my uh, my partner in this is also a registered nurse. So she's not only a registered nurse, she's also a registered hypnotherapist. And so she works in the psychiatric ward of a major hospital here in St. Louis. And she sees all types of abnormal behavior. Now, some of it's controlled through chemicals and drugs, and others re just requires a little bit of, you know, conditioning, you know, uh, socialized conditioning. But she says what we're up against on the other side is uncontrollable because we, we have to deal with it on its level, so whatever level it's at. So if it's, if it's cowering in fear 
or regret or dread, all that bleeds through. And if that attaches to someone, then they're going to suffer that. Okay. It's not, um, a, it's not a possession. It's not a possession, but it, it does close. play with their mind. All right, so um, here's a question for you. If somebody calls you, mm -hmm. um, I would imagine with the work you do, uh, you would get calls from people distressed with an mm -hmm. attachment or with a haunting or with, you know, do you get these calls? And if so, how do you react to them? Uh, we, uh, I, I go over the, the, the trouble list, you know, the, the list of things. Do they have uh, migraine headaches? Or are they suffering from any chronic pain? No, what I mean is, do you actually you know, go to people's... We, we, we go. Yeah, we, we can go and investigate and get it on, get evidence for them, either audio or video or still photography, uh, hand it over to them and <laughs> then say... What would you like us to do? Because you're not crazy. There is something in your house. You know, what would you like us to do? And then I hand it over to the psychic. The psychic calls in angels or whatever she needs to do and clears the house. And I have seen this on video. It, the entities just sweep through mm -hmm. and they don't come back. Okay. Um, going and to so Skype, you're on the air with uh, Dr. Lynch. Hi. Roswell's art, Hi. and uh, hello there, uh, Dr. Lynch. Uh, pleasure to have you on the program and uh, to be listening tonight. Uh, I just wanted to call in and sort of validate a previous caller's experience uh, tuning in through the radio and uh, hearing what he said were sort of spirits or, or phenomena. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And uh, those spirit boxes, I'm telling you, are those things are 100% real. They're valid. Uh, I've, I've, I've heard dozens of hours and seen from dozens of different devices, clear, concise communication, entire sentences long to direct questions. And this stuff is, is so real. But what well, I, I sure would that, like to hear recordings. Oh, um, an excellent person uh, that does this almost on a daily basis. Uh, video, audio, thousands of dollars of equipment, top quality. His name is Steve Huff. And, okay, uh, well, we'll look into Steve He doesn't Steve do Huff. it for money or anything, but That's if fine. you want to look fact, for it's better boxes. if he doesn't do it for money. I, I really am a hands-on guy. I want to see. That's why I was impressed by the doctor's photographs tonight. I want to see evidence, uh, either photographic evidence, or I want to hear it, or whatever. So if he's got actual, you said, sentences, right? Yes. Stephen Huff has whole sentences uh, from dozens of different boxes, uh, communications with dozens of spirits. It's all up on YouTube, so, so it can all be validated. But I have one quick question uh, for the doctor Go in ahead. relation to these. Um, sometimes these spirit boxes get used by people who are speaking in English, but they do it in, in countries where that's not the primary language, say in Mexico or or some place in Europe, and they're still getting responses even though they're in another language. Uh, hmm. Would the doctor uh, perhaps uh, have a possible explanation as to why that's the case? I'd love to hear it, sure. Uh, doctor? Um, uh, there is a, a gentleman in Kansas City who does EVPs, and he gets EVPs in foreign languages. He, not only in English, he gets them in Hawaiian and some other um, American native dialect. Uh, not all of them are in English. I think it's just the entity's way of trying to communicate. Um, I don't understand. All right. Here, here, so here's a question, point. Doctor. Do entities remain in the general uh, physical area where they passed? No, not necessarily, no. In that case, we ought to be getting uh, EVPs in Swedish, German, yes. Japanese, Chinese. French. French, yes. All absolutely. of it, right? If you go to those countries and... Let's just say you go to a family who's had a recent death. No, wait a minute. You're, you're, you're reversing yourself. You're saying, uh, you, yeah, if you want to hear it in Japanese, go to Japan. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, then, then, then wait a minute. Entities do remain in the area of their passing. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, right. But I'm, I'm sure that if you had Japanese in America, um, just like these Canadians were in America, and the entity followed them here, they could easily be in America and converse with them in Japanese. They could be with the family, not necessarily with the place. But the, the rule of thumb is a person, place, or thing can be haunted or attached. Okay. Uh, very quickly Hello. to the phones. Hi, you're on the air with the doctor. Hello? Hello? Yes, Hello? Oh, hi. Um, yeah, this question is for the doctor. Uh, so I go to a 
school that actually used to be an insane asylum um, in California called California no, State no, 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 University. Don't tell me. No, no. Don't tell me. Oh, sorry, I don't need the name. No, yep. no name? Okay. All right. <laughs> sorry about that. You go to a well, school. Be, yeah, I used to be in insane asylum. So I'm calling from the dorm right now. Uh, my father used to work at the uh, insane asylum. Um, and I was just wondering if there was a way uh, to either, you know, like on both sides of the spectrum, stay away from any kind of activity or maybe, um, I guess, invite any kind of activity if I wanted, you know, just, yeah. Is that What What do you want to do, sir? You want to invite her or you want oh, to stay away? But, you know, both. I'm not really sure. Um, I guess. I guess, yeah, I want the doctor's opinion on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, doctor. Oh, yeah. So, uh, should... <laughs> he should not invite it. No, I'm, I'm of the, I'm of the, the content that no one wants, uh, another person's lifestyle Im- imposed upon themselves. So, um, no, I, I don't classify to invite it or, or do anything like that. <laughs> um, I don't even recommend them having a school. These buildings like this, that remain dormant clear across the country should yes. be destroyed. They should be destroyed. Really? And and the even though the entities would probably move on, they need to be cleared through some type of, you know, clergy or psychic uh, to pass these people on, to pass them on so there's no residue of them, you know, occupying this space. Well, uh, I again, see, here, here's what I don't get. You say that that can be cleared, that those yes. spirits can be, I guess, sent on. Is that correct? Sent on, right. That's sent on, correct. okay. But, but, yeah. but on the other hand, you said uh, so many are caught in a loop in judgment of themselves and that nothing That's moves. Right. Nothing can move them, right. Uh, this is because the structures are still there. The prisons are still standing. The, the old asylums are still there. They're still standing. And they, they have a residue of energy that... It, you know, so you remove the building, you remove the the place for the spirit to continue to cycle. Exactly, and then you send that one. You send those on to okay. the right. light. You you do it do it through a you know I don't want to say an exorcism, but you, it'd be a form of exorcism to send them on because the longer those buildings remain, the longer those entities are probably going to stay in that area, not unless they wander off. And if they wander off, they're wandering into the subdivision that is right next door, <laughs> and you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> All right. You don't uh, want that to happen. No, you, you don't. To, TMAC you know, on Skype. Hello. Skype, going once. Go on. Are you there? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead, sir. I, I just wanted to ask... If you're going to have a Halloween special? Oh, you know I am. And we're oh, we're going to be, yeah. yes, and we're going to be on Halloween all week in, in a sense, uh, talking about this sort of thing. But, oh, yes, we're going to finish it off Friday night, Saturday morning, with dead, dead. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and I wanted to ask the doctor, what's been your worst case ever where you said, you know what, I'm just going to back out? Okay, good question. Yes, um, we were doing a uh, show, a television show for Scariest Places on Earth, uh, uh, Triage, uh, I think Corporation was doing it, and we were at this uh, haunted location, and uh, somehow I got separated from the camera crew and the audio guys, and and then suddenly I realized I was by myself, which is the the worst possible scenario, Yes, and um, I'm standing there on the second floor, and something comes into the room. It is as cold as ice. I can see my breath. I see um, sheets and uh, curtains flying around and moving around like a, like a big wind or someone has just opened the door. Like a big wind has blown them inside the room. The next thing I know, I have this cold wind pushing me up against the wall. And uh, I cannot see anything. There is, you know, my camera is on. I still can't see anything, but I am ice cold, uh, freezing. What is and it, by the way, about ghosts that makes it cold where they are? Why? It's something about the way thermal dynamics work, and and they are colder than the environment. They are always about ten degrees colder than the air molecules around them. <laughs> 
And when these things get big, like a, a cloud, they can they can force you right up against the wall, and and it's freezing. It is ice cold. That'd be enough for me. Out I'd go. All right, Doctor. I want to thank you for being on the show tonight. We're way out of time here. In my pleasure. And uh, we will do it again sometime. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Good night.